So, I am going to talk about the autism spectrum, and I'm not sure why autism in particular got such, such a big piece of the pie here. Maybe just because there was a big kerfuffle about changes in autism diagnostic criteria, do you think? Um, have you guys heard about some controversy over the last, uh, when did the, when did the kerfuffle start? The working draft came out 2009, I think, summer 2009. I think that's when the real intense upset began because people went to APA's site. I don't know if you, some of you may have done that. You could go on to APA's site starting about then and see what they were proposing. And I don't know how the proposed changes relate to the final draft for the other disorders, but for autism spectrum disorders, it's been pretty close. What, what came out was pretty close to what they proposed, and people got upset about it. Do you know what people got upset about? Anybody? Hazelwood? I know somebody out there does. What did people get mad about when, the, uh, when that working document came out? They yes. dropped Asperger's. Okay. That was probably, there were a lot of things, but that was probably the big thing. Yeah, um, I think Aspies had a big grassroots network. They had a big self-advocacy group. Who likes to be dropped? You know, none of us like to be dropped. If it's a diagnosis or a term, that it's a term that they had kind of <clears throat> taken for themselves and liked, and they didn't want it to be taken out. So that was part of it. We're, we're going to look at a couple of other smaller controversies too, but that was that was a big part of the fuss. And you know, I've sort of been. I, I part think of that it was they got lost in the system. Oh, here's your talk. Say more about it. Now Essentially, what happens instead of just having the diagnosis code <laughs> change and the name change, we also wouldn't have it. Like one of the major controversies was that if you were of normal or higher intellectual functioning, you would have about a 50-50 chance of not being diagnosed at all, whereas before you would be solidly diagnosed under either mm -hmm. Asperger's or high-functioning, you know, uh, what do you call, autism. Mm -hmm. So I don't intend that to be true in my practice, but I hear what you're saying that the concern was, and we'll look at some research that looked at the impact of people with high IQs um, changing from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Good, good comment. Keep the comments coming. So objectives, well, I want you all to stay awake-ish, <laughs> unless you're so tired that you need a little nap, and in that case, that's good. But if you're trying, if you want to learn something, I want you to be able to stay awake. I know it's late afternoon. Um, we want to be able to, I, some of you, how many already know what the changes are? How many have already looked at the DSM-5 and have read through the autism, the new autism stuff? I expected that a lot of you probably have. Maybe a few haven't, so I'll put them up here. We'll talk about what the American Psychiatric Association says is their rationale for that. And then we've already started to talk about the controversy a little bit. And then I'll show you some results from a couple of studies, or maybe more than, more than a couple. Um, so here are the diagnostic criteria. So we've got, here's another, um, this slide is going to show us one big change. We have dif differences in social communication and social interaction. Um, the DSM four had communication and social differences in two separate little sections, so you had to have, had to have each. They've been collapsed into one for the DSM-5, and um, that kind of drives me crazy, not because I have the research to prove that it's wrong. I have just been thinking about uh, sort of three core differences in autism for about 100 years, and it's hard for me to switch. I think what they found was that when they tried to reliably distinguish between these two sets of categories, social functioning and communication functioning are so intertwined that they could not reliably pull them apart, and so they did not anymore. They put them together. And it's kind of funny. Some of you may know Bev Harp, who's a great social worker and self-advocate. Oh, hello. Mm -hmm. Some of you may know Bev Harp. And she and I have a long-standing argument about what's the deep core of developmental differences in autism. I think it's social. 
she thinks it's communication. And what is kind of cool about this is, yes, they, I guess they settled our argument by saying, you're both. Yeah, we can both be happy. <laughs> so these are, to, these are all together now. You've got differences in social-emotional reciprocity. I won't read you all the examples there, although I could give you examples or talk about more if you wanted to know. Some of you probably have some pretty good examples. Um, differences in nonverbal communicative behaviors. Um, differences in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. If you look, I mean, I, I've always thought and will always think that an important component of giving a proper autism diagnosis is the diagnostician's very deep experience with and knowledge of autism. There is no checklist that can easily do it for you. There is no measure that can easily do it for you. And when I look at these, it makes me think even more how deep experience and knowledge has to be. Develop, knowledge of development, typical development, atypical development, um, just because they're, look at number three, think of all the ways that could look for a 14-month-old, for a 60-year-old that also has mood disorder. I mean, it's just really uh, fairly broad and people have to make some of their own um, applications of it. So there are specifiers. I guess there are specifiers you've told us all throughout the DSM-5, and I think I've got some to show you. So this is my, I don't know, it's hard for me to pick a favorite. The conference but. is about to end. Hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we had extra time. All right. So um, I, I don't know. I can't pick a favorite, but this is certainly um, a core difference in autism that I really value a lot and I think that offers a lot to the world. Um, the DSM-5 calls it restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. And you'll notice that when I go through these, the DSM has, and that's the DSM's right, it's going to call these deficits, deficits, impairments, I don't know, suffering. And I'm typically going to try to call them differences or unusual patterns because that's what they are to me. I'm going to have to ask the person or their family or their environment to see if they're causing, if these differences are causing distress. Sometimes they're bringing something wonderful to us. Um, so stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, what could these look like? Anything. Yeah, tapping or looking at wheels or your hands. Um, insistence on sameness and flexible adherence to routines, sort of ritualistic behavior. Humans tend to be pretty routine-based in general, and our friends with autism spectrum disorders may particularly thrive on routine and sameness. Um, Restricted fixated interests, I call these special interests or driven interests or strong interests. And a lot of times these are not only interests but they're talents or skills that may go along with this narrow high focus area. And then interestingly, the DSM put, um, it's, I think it's great that they brought in sensory differences and put it in the core characteristics, but they brought it into um, spe the special interest area. So you can have hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in <coughs> sensory aspects of the environment. I like that phrase. I mean, I don't know who determines if the smelling and touching of objects is excessive, but maybe if it's causing difficulty or interfering with the person doing something that they need to get done or that someone else wants them to get done, <laughs> probably more likely. Um, so these symptoms have to be present in the early developmental period. And I had somebody review, somebody smarter than me, review these slides for me, and then he said, well, what is the early developmental period? So I started to look, and I started to look in the whole DSM-5. It says early developmental period a lot. And unless somebody else sees something that I haven't seen, it really doesn't clearly say what the early developmental period is. So it's giving us a little bit of flexibility. I mean, obviously, it's in childhood at some point, but it's not, not as specific. 
maybe as the DSM-4 <coughs> might have been. Um, symptoms have to cause clinically significant impairment in social occupation or other important areas of current functioning. These differences cannot be better explained by an intellectual disability or by general global delay. And if a person has intellectual disability, then they need to have social communication differences that are greater than their degree of intellectual disability that they have overall. And they need to have those strong and special interests as well. This is something, if you can see the red here, this is something that we're going to talk about later. Um, a couple of things. First, individuals with a well-established DSM-4 diagnosis of autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, or pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, should be given the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. I do not know if that was in the working document, but you can imagine why it's here, because people were very worried that they'd been getting services for 20 years under an autism spectrum disorder and maybe they wouldn't meet criteria and would suddenly be deprived of the services. So this is trying to get at that. The other interesting thing here is individuals who have differences in social communication, but basically who don't have the special interest, restricted interest part, they're supposed to be considered for this diagnosis, social pragmatic communication disorder. Do we have some speech language folks here? Uh, do you know if we have any in the audience? This goes under yeah. language disorders, and we'll talk about it more later. There, I actually read a critique on it by sort of a well-known speech pathologist, so I think there's some controversy about this social pragmatic communication disorder out there. Um, so here are some specifications. So if you recall, Asperger's disorder was given to people who did not have intellectual delays, right? That was one of the characteristics that you needed for that diagnosis. So you still have a specifier here, and you're able to specify with or without accompanying intellectual differences. I kind of like this being here because I think it's helpful to know people's overall cognitive development, to know something about that. And, and this sort of prompts people that it, would, it might be a good idea to assess that. You can also do with or without accompanying language impairment. I think most people would agree that it's a good idea to get language and communication information, evaluation information, assessment for people on the autism spectrum. So I think that makes sense too. You say whether it's associated with a known medical or genetic condition, like fragile X syndrome, for example, or with some other kind of neurodevelopmental, um, other kind of disorder. And then interestingly, um, catatonia has come in here. And I really haven't seen that. I, I, I couldn't even estimate, begin to estimate how many people on the autism spectrum I've seen over the years. And I've definitely seen one person with some outstanding and progressive catatonia, but it just hasn't been something that I've seen frequently. So I thought it was interesting that somebody in the, in the working group must have thought it was important that it be there. All right, so you can do the severity level, one through three. It's kind of like the intellectual disability little tables that we looked at. You can just look and see what seems to fit best. And as you pointed out, there are bound to be some disagreement between diagnosticians about which level a person falls under. So this is requiring very substantial support. Let's see. Level two is requiring substantial support. I see a misspelling up there. I'd like to blame that on the DSM, but I'm not sure if I can. And then level one is requiring support. We have examples here. A person who can speak in full sentences and communicate, that has difficulty with reciprocal conversation, who may have difficulty making or maintaining friendships. So, Asperger's disorder, not in the DSM-5 anymore, right? Pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. Considered to many to be a plague upon the diagnostic world because it was confusing. People would get the diagnosis and then not be eligible for services with it, which was very distressing to families. Um, so that's also gone from the DSM-5. Brett syndrome, I think gone under the autism spectrum umbrella, but I assume potentially present as a medical diagnosis. And then childhood disintegrative disorder, which is a sort of um, late regressive subtype of autism that used to be in the DSM, 
I think that diagnosis was not given very often, um, so that's also been taken away. <coughs> um, and you might have heard of some of these terms, high functioning autism, still out there, still will be used. I think Asperger's syndrome will certainly be used for a while, at least casually. Infantile autism, childhood autism, atypical autism, autistic disorder, all gone and replaced by autism spectrum disorder. So the APA says that the DSM-5 changes increase emphasis on the spectrum, the continuum of the autism spectrum, and certainly people have, professionals have been talking about the spectrum for a long time. So they see the, these changes as reflecting that it's all on a spectrum, and that's a big spectrum. They also say, I'm not sure if I agree with this, they say that they're diagnosed, that this, the new set of criteria increase emphasis on requiring characteristics of ASD from early childhood. Even if you don't notice the characteristics of the person doesn't seek a diagnosis or services until later, in retrospect, those differences should be there. So the DSM-5 feels that they have emphasized this more. So you would get at that through history? Mm hmm You know, the idea is that symptoms are going to be peaking what, two, three, four years of age, maybe even a little on the early side of that. So the farther you get from that period, the more life the person lives, the more intervention they're getting, the more unique they're becoming, the more challenging it is to make a diagnosis. That's part of the emphasis on early diagnosis. But I think this is here to try to say, well, we can at least go back and see if that person appeared more classically autistic when they were a three-year-old. You know, video is useful for that too. Sometimes you can see somebody as an adult and think, you are an unusual individual. It is nice to meet you. Hello. But then if you look at video, because, you know, people nowadays, adults have videos of themselves when they were little kids, not like my generation. But young adults, you can look back and when they were three or four, there they are twirling, spinning, and doing a lot of the things that are a little bit easier to recognize as falling on the autism spectrum. So I think the retrospective part is important. Sometimes you don't have anybody to interview about what early developmental history was like, but sometimes you do. All right, so this is a study put forth by the American Psychiatric Association, and I can get you the whole um, reference list, and it actually may be on your PowerPoint if you downloaded it. Puerta at all. Um, this is basically um, APA's study that they wanted to put forth to show that the DSM-5 is not going to massively change the set of people that will get an autism spectrum <coughs> diagnosis. So they did, quote, <coughs> symptom extraction from previously collected data. Um, and then they, this study showed that the new criteria still identified about 91% of children who had had PDD. The spectrum used to be called the pervasive developmental disorder spectrum. Now it's called the autism spectrum. So about 91% of those PDD kids still had a diagnosis on the autism spectrum. That's what Huerta said. But Huerta did not remain unchallenged. People didn't just write, take a note and move on with their life. People said, I'm going to look at that myself. I don't know if I believe it. So, oh, this isn't what I thought I was going to. Well, at some point I should talk to you about some different studies. Unless I skip them, let me go back. Sorry if I'm giving you whiplash here. Somewhere I've got some more studies to talk about. Let's keep going and see if I can get to them. So what's the APA's rationale for the changes that they made? I quoted for you. They believe that these new criteria represent a more accurate and medically and scientifically useful way of diagnosing individuals with autism spectrum disorders. And the work group believes that a single umbrella disorder will improve the diagnosis of ASD without limiting the sensitivity of the criteria or substantially changing the number of children being diagnosed. So, I don't know what I think about that. Let's learn some more. This is just a funny picture of uh, some people getting ready to get closed in the DSM. Who wants to be in the DSM? I guess you don't want to be in the DSM until you need something. Then you think, well, 
Maybe I better be in the DSM if it's going to get me something. It's kind of a catch-22. So some of the criticism that the new guidelines have taken, three main questions. How about that transition from the three core symptoms to two? Some old people like me said, I like three. I've been using three for 20 years. And then the committee said, we don't care. You'll have to change. Um, creation of a single spectrum disorder rather than the group of related disorders that we had before. And then whether the new criteria are too narrow and are some people going to lose eligibility or some people that would have been eligible not be eligible for services anymore. So, okay, here's the other study I was looking for. So Fred Volkmar, who was one of the member, he, Volkmar was, if not the, he was certainly a major player on the DSM-4 uh, task force, you know, sort of creating Asperger's syndrome and that kind of work. So he was on this new committee as well, mostly because I think he was too powerful for them to not invite. So he was on it, and here he is collaborating with these other two researchers. They also reanalyzed old data. Um, it was DSM, they took DSM-4 field trials, and they saw what DSM-4 diagnoses people got, and then reanalyzed it based on DSM-5 criteria. Is anybody into this besides me? I, re <laughs> I really got into this. Maybe not so much for other people. Thank you for bearing with me. So remember the other figure was 91% of the people still got the diagnosis? Well, this study came up with 60% of the people. So lower number. And the interesting thing for them is that for people with lower IQs, about 70% of them met. For people with this kind of comes back to Karen's thought. For people with higher IQs, only about 46% in this study. So this was sort of a panicking study to a lot of people. And I, I guess I have to say, I don't think I believe the 91% and I don't, I don't think I believe the 46% either because I would be panicked if I thought only 46% were gonna retain, you know, retain eligibility for services. So they took this to APA and said, all right, you had that other study that said 91%, look at our study. And the APA said, no we don't like your study. And I uh, believe uh, Volkmar then walked out. That's, he really got mad and I'm pretty sure that he left. So he was really influential and he still is influential. Um, he's the editor of JAD, but um, he got mad about the reception to his study. Catherine Lord, who's another really influential person in autism, she's the creator of the ADOS she was on the working group, DSM-5 working group too, and I think she and Volkmar must have had some differences. So she came in and said, I thought a pretty good critique. You can't use the DSM-5 criteria with information gathered from older versions because the DSM-5 questions weren't asked. DSM-5 questions are not terribly different. So I don't know. I kind of, I can see how they, they could go back and get DSM-5 information based on DSM-4 questions. I'm not sure if the questions are that different, but that's what she said. And she's actually done, then she came in and did a study, a more recent study, that went back to the original APA thing, which showed that most people were retaining diagnoses. So this has been back and forth and back and forth. She couldn't do it based on old data. How'd she do the study? She did use it on old data. I went back and looked to see if she did because I saw that comment. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I assume that was all she was able to do quickly and at the time. She ab I, I, ab I went to look to say, oh, did she get new data? No, she didn't. Um, so Johnny Matson, who's another, I don't know, very um, old and distinguished individual in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities, he was on the committee, and, and it almost seems as if he was a mediator between the others. So he came in and said, look, why don't we just try to find out um, what happens to some of these people that may not get the diagnosis now? Why don't we see what their needs are? I think that's a very sensible approach. And he did one study, and I think is doing more, to try to look at if you were eligible in DSM-4, and if you're in that, what, mo what APA is claiming is the minority, a small percentage of people that w might not be eligible in DSM-5, are you still okay without services or did this hurt you in some way, in which case, you know, I don't know what they're going to do about it at this point. And then Matson, he looked at, he's interested in um, really early, anybody here work in early childhood? <coughs> Matson actually has worked with adults some too, but he's interested in early childhood 
And he, d he did a study looking at whether little guys kept their diagnoses under the new criteria. And I'm sorry to say that I don't have a percentage on there, but I know there certainly was a percentage of even little, little preschoolers that might have lost their diagnosis. Now, one of the things that we should talk about is that some of these um, sort of lost diagnoses or people that fell off eligibility didn't have an autistic disorder diagnosis to begin with. Some of them had a PDDNOS disorder, which has long been a suspect disorder and sort of a confusing disorder. Some of them may not have been receiving services already because they had this sort of confusing disorder that may not have met service provision criteria. So it's not like people have jumped straight from having autistic disorder to having no diagnosis. I think a lot of those people that jumped off had this PDDNOS, people were not entirely certain that they met criteria for an autism spectrum disorder fully, even under the DSM-4. Okay, sorry to jump off the detail bandwagon on you on that. I, I wanted to let um, self-advocates have their say on this, or at least to reflect some of what they said. Um, GRASP is just one example of a highly articulate um, group of people on the autism spectrum who have a lot to say about everything, policies relating to autism. Um, bef between the time that the working document came out and the time that the actual publication came out, they were extremely active in asking for independent scientific review of proposed changes by people that were not on the working group and um, doing risk ben benefit analysis of the impact on clinical services and trying to find out what this would mean to people, you know, not clinicians, but humans. And here's a quote from the person that was the executive director at the time. Kind of interesting. <coughs> the DSM committee members speaking to the media were Cup for a Lord and Dr. Brian H. King. King says no one will lose their diagnosis. Kupfer says, we have to make sure not everybody who's a little odd gets a diagnosis of autism. It becomes a cost issue. So that person just came out and said what a lot of people have been thinking. And then Lord, here's Lord again, Catherine Lord, attempted to reassure people while not denying that some will be left out. Volkmar, oh there, yeah, there you go. Volkmar resigned from the committee. So that's what Michael John Carley said. I like the idea that at least, I don't know about for other diagnoses, I like the idea that for the autism spectrum, people who had received these diagnoses were paying attention to what the scientific community, clinical community was doing. So let's look at social pragmatic communication disorder. Who's heard of it? This exact title, I think, you t you're the speech path. This exact title is new, correct? It was pragmatic language disorder talked about before. Pragmatic means social language. So um, the idea about this is that it's going to be a lot of the social communicative differences that we see on the autism spectrum, but without the restricted repetitive interest. Now, I read a critique, and I actually wrote this woman's name, um, Tager Flusberg, who's a, a researcher that's done some big um, grant-funded studies on diagnostic validity for some different speech-language characteristics. And she had actually studied pragmatic communication disorder years ago in the 1990s. And so she, she didn't think, she doesn't think that this disorder should really exist separately. Her research showed that most people that fulfilled the criteria here could actually go into either a specific language impairment or a language disorder diagnosis or on the autism spectrum, she's not sure if this is something separate from those two categories. So she doesn't like it. And she felt like, I think you mentioned this about some other categories, she felt like it was put in there without maybe the proper research backing. And she said she's going to be curious to see if it stays, if it goes. Um, so there it is, social pragmatic communication disorder. The implication that I heard is that people that would have gotten PDDNOS would now get this. But it all depends on what their characteristics were like. To get this, they have to be special interest free to fulfill this quality. Oh, here's more. Just some more specifiers for that one. So I don't know how much we need to spend on this. Just some informal.
characteristics associated with ASD. I thought we might talk about them briefly before we finish. We're getting close to finishing. Communication, anybody have any questions or thought? I have some things listed here that aren't necessarily written in the DSM, but that we might look at as, bless you, characterizing communication differences in autism, social interaction, differences in imitation. I don't know if this would go under social and communication, and now with the new DSM-5, it doesn't matter. Maybe this is a good thing. But um, changing a message or the delivery of a message to meet the needs of a listener, I don't know if that's on my list, but I think that's a really good one for folks that are very bright. might still be hard for them to match their content or tone. They may speak to some kid in the playground the same way they speak to the principal when they've been called in on a rule infraction. That's not a good idea. It could get you in trouble. But it may, it may not be easy for them to perceive the difference in those audiences. Um, special interests. Gosh, narrow range of strong interests. Anybody have any great examples? Gosh, we have some wonderful artists who have great memory skills and a great drive to record. Now, I am spacing out on the guy's name. Who's the guy that does those wonderful panoramas? Have, have you guys seen this guy? Stephen, is it Stephen Wiltshire? Karen, is that right, Stephen Wiltshire? I think it's Stephen Wiltshire. If you haven't seen his work, look, you can look up Stephen Wiltshire, Rome. Stephen Wiltshire, Madrid. Stephen Wiltshire, he has been painting buildings in detail for a long time from memory, and that's what he spends most of his time doing. But lately, in recent years, um, people have seen what he could do, and so they fly him in a helicopter over whatever, Rome, Florence, wherever they are. And then he goes back to his location with a big, massive piece of paper and draws it, all of it. So just to show you, that's one end of what a special interest and a special talent can look like. And on the other end might be, or another place on that spectrum, might be somebody who loves to flip strings and the teacher has to make sure that there are no strings visible anywhere because if the person can find them, they will get them and flip them, even if they're attached to somebody. So there's just a huge spectrum of intense interest, but to get an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, you have to have <coughs> intense interest. Um, Oops, I'm doing my Mac mouse instead of the PC mouse. Sensory differences, we have any OTs in the audience? Hopefully, OTs. OTs are good at looking at um, people being extra sensitive or maybe not sensitive, not as sensitive so that they seek certain sensory experiences. Anybody have a good example or something to ask about with that? Sometimes you get picky eaters super picky eaters can't just be french fries but it needs to be dairy queen french fries cooked on wednesdays after four so you can get pretty selective with what you'll eat and we have to work with those guys to help them be able to face some other kinds of foods or sensory situations um cognitive differences and cognitive learning styles sort of associated differences, although not core differences, but there certainly is research on learning style differences. Um, there can be some difficulty in attending to multiple cues or to general cues, rather some really good skill at narrowing in on certain um, more narrow cues in the environment, things in the environment. You can get language delays can get executive functioning challenges. Ah, oh, here's something I want to make sure and tell you guys. In the DSM-4, um, ADHD and autism were, were supposedly mutually exclusive, although in practice I didn't find that that was true. People would give both diagnoses sometimes. So the DSM-5 doesn't say that you can't give, give or have both of those diagnoses. So we know that there are executive functioning challenges present in most of people on the autism spectrum, but if you have that present to a very striking degree, if it's causing a lot of impairment, if there's strong inattentiveness, then somebody could potentially be evaluated for ADHD as well as autism. And, and that was supposedly forbidden in the open. Everybody's yawning. Okay. 
Woo. And I don't know why. This is the most interesting stuff in the world. I do not have any driven interest or repetitive interest myself. You might be listening to me talk about one of mine. Next thing you know, I'll have my cat and dog pictures up here. I will, they, Matt wouldn't let me. He, would not, he, he cut all the slides that had my other interests on them. <laughs> all right, so strength in rote memory, the ability to recall a lot of straightforward information, but maybe more challenges with working memory, which is why schedules are nice, schedules that go with us. So when we're going somewhere, we can look down and remind ourselves, I, I need this too. Oh, yeah, I'm going here. So that's working memory challenges, um, complex decoding kinds of challenges. Um, so we might have people that are really great decoders, but they're still working on developing that comprehension that goes along with what they can read. So sometimes decoding and some of those skills are in advance of, of some of the other comprehension aspects. Um, attentional difficulties or differences. Um, folks on the autism spectrum are really good at establishing a set, but once they establish it, they may have difficulty switching it. So however you want it to be, you might set it up that way from the beginning because it might not be easy to switch it later on. Differences in joint attention and the delayed emergence of joint attention um, and short attention spans maybe, but if it's a topic of interest, a forever attention span maybe. They may have a short attention span for your topic of interest, but maybe not for their own. Okay, I think this is my last slide just to give you hope. So these are some co-occurring disorders. I mean, it could be anything in the DSM-5, anything, right? If we don't diagnostically overshadow, then we know that anybody with autism or intellectual disability could have anything else that any of the rest of us could have. But some of the common ones that I see in clinical practice, I have mostly, although not entirely, a clinical sample for people that I am able to know. And I see a lot of people with anxiety that they're dealing with, all across the age spectrum. Depression. Um, from sort of older childhood, adolescence on, and sometimes our folks will get mood disorder symptoms for the first time in pre-adolescent kind of period, and maybe they never needed treatment for that until then, and then that comes, comes to them. Obsessive compulsive disorder, some of that compulsivity is a natural part of the spectrum, but sometimes it might be a bigger problem and they might get that diagnosis. ADHD we've already talked about, certainly can see tics, um, can see intellectual disability at some degree of a higher percentage than typical population. I don't know if anybody was studying back in the day when I was getting my degree, it used to be 70%. You, does anybody remember that figure? We used to say that 70% of people who had autistic disorder also had intellectual disability. And now that figure doesn't match our current population anymore. And by the way, I actually have a, throw this out as a question. So somebody had quoted, and I had seen a CDC study saying that our current um, prevalence rate, a current occurrence rate with autism is one in 50. But then I, before I came in here, I went to the CDC site where I always go, and I saw one in 88. Does anybody know which of those is accurate? I'm going to go with a more conservative one in 88, but I. I'm guessing that we're moving toward one in 50. I, I wish I had this on a slide. I jotted down just so you could see some of the numbers through the years, thinking about sort of holding the criteria steady or, you know, are we getting to the point where maybe we need to hold and, and not um, make our criteria any vaguer or more inclusive. So, um, and I'm not saying whether we should or should not, but I think the task force was wondering about this. So 1975, I tried to pick some markers that had personal relevance to me. 1975, I don't know what the relevance is of that. I was a kid. 1975, one in 5,000 people had autism at that point, were considered to have autism. 1985, that's when I graduated from high school, so I picked that. And that's one in 2,500 at that point. Um, then, I should have gotten 1990, but I didn't. 1995, just, a, just right at the cusp of the DSM-4 coming out, um, and when I graduated from my graduate program, that, it was one in 500 at that point, according to the CDC stats. 2007, I don't know why I picked 2007, just because it was kind of recent. One in 150, so now 2014, either one in 88 or moving maybe toward one in 50. So there's been some pretty dramatic change 
and the, the Centers for Disease Control's estimate of the numbers of people with autism spectrum in the population. So I think probably to some degree or the other that was on the mind of the task force when they worked on these criteria. And that's all I have. Questions, anybody? Question. Yes. What do you attribute our researchers, so what do they attribute the changes in numbers over time to? Well, nobody knows for sure, and a lot of people are arguing about it. We know that diagnostic criteria and diagnostic practices have changed. So those have changed and have become more inclusive. I mean, before Asperger's disorder was in the DSM, people really didn't expect people with typical cognitive levels to get an autism diagnosis. And even though Asperger's disorder is gone, I think that knowledge that these characteristics can be present in people with typical cognitive functioning levels um, is still with us. So definitely changes in diagnostic practices, and some people think some other type of either prenatal exposure or some sort of uh, maybe prenatal, a prenatal exposure that's a trigger to some underlying genetic vulnerability, um, complex, a lot of complex research going on on the topic. Good question. Do you think part of it's better guidelines for pediatricians to identify these diagnoses? Well, we've got the MCHAT, right? From the years. Yeah, from, from, from previous. I mean, I think so. I, I just think, I think that maybe not necessarily just clearer criteria, but criteria that are more inclusive of a broader range of people. I remember when we looked at that social communication set of criteria there, could include a lot of different you know, unique developmental patterns in there, I think. Anybody else? Anybody from a distant site? Have anything to say? Anybody awake at a distant site? Are you guys texting out there? <laughs> if you are, I hope you're texting somebody. We can hear you. Um, yeah, I wanted to confirm the statistic on one out of 88. That's the one that I'm most recently familiar with. That's what I saw, too. Do you think I made up the one in 50? Am I starting an evil, so. you know, gossip? But it could be moving in that direction. I mean, if you look well, let's, at how let's it stick with one. Thank you for checking on that. Let's stick with one in 88 for today. <laughs> Anything else? Ready for our next presenter? Hello. Yes. Can you hear? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, uh, could you speak to um, what effect that? The, avail the increase in availability of funding for autism spectrum disorders may have, may have on increasing um, diagnosis in what could be considered borderline cases. What do you think, Jim? Well, I, I think Obviously, yes. you have something to think about it. Tell me, tell us what you think. We can hear you. Well, I think you, what you see is when you have an increase in funding, there's going to be an increase in the in diagnoses and along borderline cases yeah. Um, yeah. to get the support for individuals that they might not otherwise have uh, access to. And we've talked about that with ADHD, right? I mean, if there's no Ritalin or no research supporting that Ritalin does anything, if there's no 504 plan available or you can't get an IEP, why do you go see a doctor and have your kid diagnosed? Why, why should you add a diagnosis if there's no outcome to come out of it? So, you know, maybe we could say that for borderline diagnoses, but maybe we could just say that, and that may be true for autism. With ADHD, I think it's just true for diagnoses. Why get a diagnosis of ADHD, especially if you're a parent seeking it for a child, if you don't think that there's something helpful that can ha happen with your child as a result of it? So I think the same thing for autism. If you are, if your child has <coughs> level one autism and is doing okay, Maybe you want to get that formalized if you think they can get some more supports, or maybe there's something that you think that they need in school, and you know somebody else's child who's gotten it, and you hope you can get it. It really does make sense for you to seek that diagnosis. I think, I think that's a good human impulse, um, and wouldn't necessarily be. I think sometimes when we think about cost containment and cost issues, we're assuming that everybody's going to need super intense need and want super intense services. I think sometimes for 
Oh, good. I'm glad you guys are still out there. I think sometimes for people on those sort of borderline ranges, you know, it, it might be a quite an expensive, very minor service that would make a huge difference in their ability to get a job or to live independently. Um, and if we give good intervention all along, we may be able to prevent some of the co-occurring disorders that come in and further disable people from having good quality of life. So I, I think I, it's a really good question, and I wish we had time to argue it more. I'd, I'd love to hear what more people have to say. I guess we should move to depressive and personality disorders. I don't think that's going to work. We should say that Christy I, is having some an expressive she's having some issue. vocal volume issues today. So um, I'm very thankful to my friend Tony Lobianco to be my voice today. Yes, sorry. We were office mates for a while, and I thought I could read her mind. I'm not sure if I can read her handwriting. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to do the best on both regards, and she'll smack me if I say anything wrong or um, don't say anything that she wrote. So um, coming from Christy, and ask us questions, and she'll whisper answers in my ear, and I'll relate them to you. Um, Christy is a licensed clinical social worker in private practice in Lexington. She has four children aged one year to 18 years. Uh, and being a mom is her favorite job. Uh, for this final section, uh, I was charged with discussing the impact of clinical work as well as briefly touching on both depressive disorders and personality disorders. Um, a, a note before we start is that DSM-5 becomes, quote, active on October 1st of this year. Um, it's out now, but third-party reimbursements and agencies need time to adjust and update their systems. Okay. Um, I have to inform the other presenters that my daughter, her daughter, uh, has unofficially diagnosed them with APHD. Uh, this requires a bit of explaining. I was lamenting the fact yesterday evening over dinner with my family that I was feeling nervous about this presentation because I was the only one without a doctorate. My daughter heard, I'm the only one without APHD. And she envisioned me on a stage with three behaviorally disordered individuals. <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> my, apolog my apologies, I should really say three individuals with behavior disorders, or I may lose my HDI affiliation for not following the use of person-first language. Um, I am proud to share that I worked for HDI for four years as a research assistant with a great office mate. That was me. Um, um, and it is very nostalgic for me to be here today. Thank you, Mary Beth Valance, for the invitation to join this panel. Okay, you can see the basic structural changes. Do you want me to read these or just the notes? Okay. Um, Dr. Gladowski uh, shared much of this information on this slide with you in the opening of this panel presentation, but I thought it might be helpful to offer a brief review as well. I won't belabor all of the points, but emphasize those that most significantly impact clinical practice. It is helpful to remember that the changes in the DSM-5 represent a researcher's dream, but a clinician's nightmare. Increasing the complexity and specificity of mental health disorders offers researchers the opportunity to identify sets and subsets of the population for further research. However, that same complexity and specificity presents some challenges in direct clinical practice. Let's briefly run through the structural and diagnostic changes and discuss the benefits and challenges. Structural benefits. Um, Coordination with the ICD-10 allows mental health providers to keep up with trends in the medical field, not only domestically, but internationally. Work is actually underway for an IDC-11, but at least the coding in the DSM-5 will bring us up to the, the, what we need currently. Arabic numerals allow for the more frequent revision with the decimal point, i.e. 5.1, um, potentially even an online revision between print versions, or frequent online revisions between print versions. Uh, this could challenge clinicians to maintain a continuous vigilance to ensure accurate coding for reimbursement and potentially offer more loopholes for insurance companies to deny claims. <clears throat> Diagnostic benefits. Um, following the trend of mental health parity legislation, the verbiage change in the DSM-5 from differential diagnosis from medical disorders to other medical disorders uh, fosters the understanding that mental health disorders are medical disorders too. This allows for the reduction in stigmatization and could possibly encourage more individuals to seek treatment who would otherwise not do so. Being able to more accurately diagnose 
with increasing specificity allows for more detailed research. If we understand that individuals diagnosed with major depressive disorder are at an increased risk of suicide, we can take more clinical precautions. If we know how individuals with major depressive disorder with anxious distress differ from those with traditional MDD, we may learn how to more effectively provide intervention. Research informed us that it was precisely when depression appears to be improving that individuals are at the highest risk for completing a successful suicide. All clinicians bemoan the overdiagnosis of bipolar disorder in children, and the newly included disruptive mood dysregulation disorder will offer a more accurate, le more accurate, lesser severe diagnostic option in many cases, which will alter treatment, hopefully, in the reduction of use of serious psychotropic medication on a vulnerable population with brains that are still in the formative stages. Challenges to clinical practice. Um, we like to think that we are objective observers and accurate diagnosticians. However, there is a level of subjectivity in differential diagnosis that presents issues for practitioners. There are no blood tests or bio, bio, ah, sorry, biomarkers for most mental health diagnoses. Clinicians rely heavily on client and family reports, collateral information from other providers, and clinical observation. However, if you ask 10 therapists to complete a psychosocial assessment on the same individual, it's very likely that there will be significant variance in the resulting diagnosis. When considering the diagnoses are intended to guide intervention, this can be life-changing for an individual who is recommended to pursue individual insight-oriented talk therapy, therapy, group dialectical behavioral therapy, a potential cocktail of psychotropic medications, electroconvulsive shock therapy, or some combination. Losing sight of context with the loss of AXIS-4 may also contribute to significant change in diagnosis and treatment. If we have a four-year-old who cannot attend to academic tasks at school, is disruptive and bouncing off the walls in the classroom, and refusing to follow directions at home, an inexperienced clinician may quickly jump to the conclusion that this child meets the criteria for ADHD. However, if one were to look a little deeper and discover that the same child was regularly exposed, exposed to domestic violence at home, Prior to a recent removal, one would understand that this child could be experiencing the effects of trauma. This distinction significantly alters the course of recommended treatment. Third party reimbursement mandates an immediate diagnosis, rushing the differential diagnostic processes and preventing a thorough evaluation. This is not a challenge unique to the DSM-5, but a more universal one. Accurate assessment takes time and relationship, things that 25-page intake forms with hundreds of checkboxes do not allow for. The DSM-5 in particular is so complex and specified and inclusive of what was previously sometimes considered normal human experience that it becomes difficult to identify individuals who would not meet criteria for something in the DSM-5, my family included. Um, two out of six of us may meet criteria for premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, along with 51% of the world's population. My husband would frequently be in caffeine withdrawal, and four of my children would regularly meet criteria for disruptive mood dysregulation disorder because they are teenagers and toddlers. The hudas, how do you pronounce that? Hudas. Hudas. I was right. Hey. Um, it's a thoroughly and potentially useful tool, however, it does not lend itself to promoting the type of therapeutic rapport and alliance necessary to promote change. In fact, like so many other forms and too much paperwork, it can be counterproductive and may explain why a good percentage of new clients do not return following an intake appointment in agencies that demand such. More diagnosis equaling more medications is obvious. When considering the influence of pharmaceuticals in the development of the DSM-5, it doesn't take a paranoid schizophrenic to consider the potential motive and worry about the outcome. Here is a recent example of the required coding correction due to typos in the DSM-5. Anything I should say about that? I think it speaks for itself. All right. And we forgot to include childhood as a disorder. Uh, this slide was borrowed from Dr. Jerome Wakefield from a recent presentation he gave at the Winter Conference for the Kentucky Society for Clinical Social Work back in November. It is more than a bit tongue-in-cheek, but... I'd love to go into that, but I can't. No, no I'm, 
I like the legume anorexia. <laughs> I like the whole thing. <laughs> Immaturity. Uh, what about sleep? Um, obviously, I am using sarcasm to illustrate my ultimate point um, that many people do not need diagnoses. They need healthy relationships. In fact, I would go so far as to stipulate that many of the diagnoses detailed in the DSM, any generation of the DSM, similar to the DSM-2 perhaps, um, stem from relational issues such as insecure attachment relationships with primary caregivers in early life. But this would result in a very slim DSM. Ah, that's where I'm supposed to say slimmer, similar to the DSM-2 perhaps, uh, with intervention focused on rat relational therapies that do not require medication. So I may remain in the minority on this issue. Questions. You have any questions? Really hard for me to respond. But, but I can wing it. I can just totally make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> um, depressive disorders. Um, we know that nature and biology do play a part in depression that there can be a genetic predisposition in families. I wouldn't want to rule out the impact of learned behavior, but the research on depression is well established. This slide represents changes to the section on depressive disorders in the DSM-5. Don't mean to read this slide. Okay, um, so just reading from the slide, um, new specifier considered for major depressive disorder with anxious distress, um, irrational worry, preoccupation with unpleasant worries, trouble relaxing, feeling tense, fear that something awful might happen. Like losing your voice before you have to give a presentation. Um, addition of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, addition of premenstrual dys dysphoric disorder, uh, addition of persistent depressive disorder. Can we speak about this being an upgrade from the back of the book to the front of the book? Ah, yes. I'm supposed to mention that um, the addition of the premenstrual dysphoric disorder is an upgrade from the back of the book to the front of the book. Now, can anyone tell me what that means? I can't either. Oh, I was hoping someone could. In the DSM-4, the back of the book had uh, conditions requiring further study. And in the DSM-5, uh, premenstrual dysphoric sy syndrome was promoted up to the big kid's table onto, uh, into the regular diagnosis. A good friend of mine said that uh, they should have come up with, uh, what would he call it? Uh, Testosterone deficient dys dysphoric disorder. For me. <laughs> if we can make a parallel, that in DSM 5, section 3 is like, you know, the back of the book, where with conditions for further study. So DSM 5, section 3 is like the back of the book with conditions for further study. So there's still a set of conditions for further study in the new. That, that didn't make it to the big kid's table, but. Yeah may at some point in the future. Um, just read this. Sure. Okay. Um, major depressive disorder, uh, a leading cause of disability in the U.S. for ages 15 to 44. Um, five of the nine symptoms have to be present for more than two weeks. Required for diagnosis. Okay. Re required for a diagnosis is that five of the nine symptoms have to be present for more than two weeks. Um, can we read through all these? Not necessary. Okay. Well, you can read them. <laughs> uh, bereavement exclusion has been excluded from the new DSM. Um, elimination of the bereavement exclusion. Uh, the argument for doing so is that the risk of suicidality with underdiagnosed risk of suicidality with underdiagnosis. Okay. Missing people who might otherwise meet criteria. Oh, missing people who might otherwise meet the criteria. Um, major depression is a potentially lethal disorder with an overall suicide rate of about 4%. And research has demonstrated that the highest risk of successful suicide is exactly when clients begin to improve. Um, the argument against doing so is that it may pathologize normal experience. Um, Grief may last for many months, and there may be other life stressors that, I guess, just get you a diagnosis when you really right. aren't suffering from that. If you think about the nine, five of nine symptoms, people experiencing grief and bereavement 
will qualify for this for much longer, oftentimes than two weeks, sometimes upwards of a year or even two. And so to um, potentially lump them in with an MDD diagnosis may, may or may not be appropriate, but it's important to understand the distinction. I'm so sorry for my voice. Other life stressors, um, loss of a job, loss of a relationship can also have a similar impact. Um, and it is foolish to think, if you think about it that way, that you only get two weeks, you know, to adjust, to recover, to loss of a job, spouse, whatever, major stress. Personality disorders um, represent and quote, enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the culture of the individual who exhibits it. Um, these patterns tend to be fixed and consistent across situations that are typically perceived to be appropriate by the individual even when, um, even though they may markedly affect their day-to-day -day life in negative ways. Um, so people who meet criteria for a diagnosis of a personality disorder wouldn't the thumb through any DSM and pick that out for themselves? Oh, can we keep reading this? Sure. Okay. Uh, in the DSM-5, personality disorders upgraded to Axis 1, but categorical criteria remained the same. Um, among adults, American adults, ages 18 and over, an estimated 9.1% have a diagnosable personality disorder, with the most prominent being avoidant, borderline, and antisocial PD. Uh, there's considerable evidence of overlap between the categorical PDs and dimensions versus category categories proposed in section three for further study. See alternate DSM-5 for a uh, model for personality disorders. So the alternate model is in section three, not yet at the big person's table, big kid's table, but it's considered for further use, much like premenstrual dysphoric disorder used to be. Uh, it says the pink text on this slide represents the formal categories of personality disorders. Um, in, what's that? It looks white. Oh, it looks white there. Yeah, okay. So the white text on this slide represents the formal categories of personality disorders in the DSM-5 compared to those currently existing in the DSM-4-TR. So you can see there are fewer categorical uh, diagnoses than compared to DSM-4. Um, okay. As with many sections, there was considerable dissent among members of the committee charged with the review of personality disorder. Uh, historically, additions to the back of the DSM often are upgraded to the main section in the next edition. Um, the hope here was for both sections to be useful for research and clinical work. Personality functioning and personality traits are helpful indicators even without a diagnosis of personality disorder. Oh, okay. Um, allows for the... Is that so the one? Section 3 allows for... S section 3... Uh, it, it allows for the understanding that there's often, you could say, a comorbidity of more than one personality disorder or traits that are mixed between them, and it's tough to pin down what categorical diagnosis. Um, and, and there's significant overlap in Section 3 allows for that because it is more of a... Um, um, kind of a spectrum, kind of a, um, with lots of different traits. So in the old version, you had to pick one, but now you can assign multiple ones. Is that the? You can you can have straight, uh, trait specific personality disorder and, and pick the traits um, that that are most applicable that are fit. I'm stumbling on my words and my voice there. You can pick trait specific personality disorder traits, right? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> if you want to know anything about post-school outcomes for people with disabilities, you can ask me later. <laughs> I do actually know something, just not this. Uh, not this. <laughs> this, is, um, this is all Section 3 in the back of the book. This is not currently in the DSM-5 Section 2 where we get our official diagnoses, but this is the new stuff for personality disorder that is under um, consideration. 
So criterion A for level of personality functioning, um, in terms of self, identity, experiences oneself as unique with clear boundaries between self and others, and self-direction, pursuit of co coherent and meaningful goals. And on the interpersonal, um, empathy and intimacy. And read what those mean. So we think about those as kind of protective factors for uh, typically developing individuals. And the opposite of those things would be uh, examples of, of dysfunction, um, for lack of a better word, according to personnel um, criterion. <laughs> All right, we have Criterion B, Pathological Personality Traits. It's a five-factor model, um, which Dr. Gladaski referred to earlier. Um, each trait offers multiple distinct variants. So what does all of this have to do with rehabilitation? I'll ask you now. I'll tell you what this all has to do <laughs> with rehabilitation. Uh, Dr. Prout mentioned having reviewed about 100,000 disability determination requests um, and reports, and I wonder how that number may increase after the DSM goes into effect on October 1st of this year. Um, so, oh, I.e., adult ADHD, as mentioned by Dr. Gladaski. DSM-5 grandfathers in those previously diagnosed to resolve the problem for special education. Uh, there's a note that says those who receive services will not lose them. DSM-5 will reduce the number um, of kids diagnosed with ASD going forward. Is right. that consistent with what you were stating? I think so. It might Food for thought. Um, increasing the population of people considered to have a disability increases the strain on a service system structure that is already struggling to provide adequate access to quality care. Hmm. According to the National Institute for Health, about a quarter of the American population meets criteria for mental illness at any given time. And with DSM-5, plan on seeing an increase in individuals with diagnoses. Um, okay, diagnostic codes are a means to third-party reimbursement that can facilitate research, but those very same labels potentially have lifelong impact. Um, so the, the DSM is a guide and a helpful tool, um, How, but, but not a Bible. That, Bible does not have updated editions, um, <laughs> but with the DSM, if it's not included now, it might be included later, um, and vice versa. Uh, a later bullet there, getting both closer and farther from the truth, uh, depending on your perspe perspective, um, strong advocates and strong critics. Anything? For the changes or against the changes in the DSM? According to any diagnostic label. Oh, okay. So strong advocates and strong critics of the DSM itself. Changes. Yeah. Changes in the, in the DSM. Um, okay. Uh, keep in mind that all diagnoses are variants of normal human experience. Oh, um, related to clinicians need to have a thorough understanding of the multifaceted implications of changes to the DSM. Um, it is important to keep in mind that all diagnoses are variants of normal human experience. Um, there must be evidence of personal distress and distress and interpersonal functioning. Um, labeling is concrete and, and can become self-fulfilling prophecies for individuals and labels can pre, pre exist precede, precede uh, the reputations of individuals. So in, in that I mean in the clinical work that I do, if I meet with someone who meets criteria for de of depressive disorder, the fact that I say you have depression can influence their in internal experience and they can become even more depressed just by knowing they meet criteria for a label. Um, it, it, the, the other statement there that labels precede individuals, their labels and their um, reputations just by their label can sometimes pre precede them and produce pre prejudice um, in, in a variety of settings. So I think we need to be very careful 
um, before we label an individual with any diagnosis. Y'all hear that? Good. <laughs> um, clinical recommendations. Uh, remember, research has demonstrated that effective intervention is 80% relationship and only 5% technique. Uh, remember, the medication is not always the answer. Uh, but, and let's be practical. Use codes and labels for research and reimbursement as accurately as possible, but avoid overlabeling and overdiagnosing. Um, when it comes to treatment, there is a qualitative difference between saying, tell me your story, uh, versus there's a pill for that. And finally, uh, let's keep in mind that the goal of treatment is not to be devoid of all unhappiness and distress, and that normal human experience includes both positive and negative emotional experiences. Let me read the quote. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So if you have questions, really, we'll do our best to, to relate and translate. I think that this slide in particular, I think we as humans need to understand the, the spectrum of experiences, positive neg and negative. We can't truly appreciate the positive without experiencing the negative. And if we try to remove that um, from human experience, um, what's left? Um, do, almost almost nothing and when and, and to, I work a lot with um, parents of young children and a lot of times parents I think um, I say a lot I don't mean all but oftentimes trying to prevent any kind of discomfort or distress or frustration for their children and it doesn't give an adequate experience of what life in the real world is really like. We, we do a disservice to our children sometimes by, um, by um, sheltering them, by overprotecting them, and by preventing negative experiences. And, and so when uh, we have kids who haven't had the opportunity to, to um, be in the real world, um, hit 18, um, and, and to look at their life on a textbook, it looks beautiful. And yet these kids are feeling depressed. Uh, and so um, I think I, it really behooves us as clinicians and parents and teachers to um, let kids know and help remind ourselves that uh, it is normal for us to feel sad and angry and dis disappointed and frustrated at any given time, any given day. In adolescence, your, your, the situation doesn't even necessarily have to be congruent uh, with your mood because of all of the chemical, biological, physical changes that are going on in your body. And, and kids oftentimes feel like there's something wrong with them. And if we give a, di a diagnosis, we are basically saying, you're right, there's something wrong with you that's broken or needs to be changed. And sometimes it's just typical, normal developmental experiences. And, and I think we need to not lose sight of that. So I apologize again for my voice. Thank you for bearing with myself and with Tony. I am so grateful for your voice today. Uh, it was fun. I learned stuff. So we can open up questions to any of our four panelists if anyone has come up with any. I know mental illnesses are brain disorders. Is there any research lately on personality disorders? You know, are they considered brain disorders or are they thinking they're more social, personal, maladaptive behaviors? Um, let me back up one step. Uh, there are certain biases that say that mental disorders are brain disorders, okay? The problem is that our current state of knowledge, using things like functional MRI or single photon emission computer-aided tomography, we don't know whether we're looking at the causes or the consequences okay, of a disorder. Secondly, uh, we know that brain and behavior is a two-way street that the brain generates affect, behavior, processes information, sensation. We also know, especially from the work of people like Bruce Perry, how profoundly the brain is affected by experience. <coughs> okay. So it's a two-way street. It's not either or. So it, it, 
to, to answer your question as best I can, for some personality disorders, like antisocial personality disorder, we can measure differences, for example, in prefrontal functioning. Okay? Individuals who have antisocial personality disorder tend to have lower levels of prefrontal functioning, which means that you know, if I use a, if, if I tag oxygen with a, with a tag and then I use, let's say, a functional MRI or a single, fo better yet, single photon emission tomography, that I can see that the frontal cortex of this individual as any social personality disorder is not metabolizing as much oxygen as, a, as an individual without that disorder. So that area of the brain is less active, you know, at this moment in time, okay. Is that the cause of um, antisocial personality disorder, or is it the result of a series of, you know, perhaps genetic vulnerabilities linked together with traumatic experiences that led this individual to be antisocial, and therefore investing less in the activity of the prefrontal cortex? So it, it, that, that's where we are right now. Uh, there, there are some people that hope that maybe one of these days we'll be able to you know, have biological markers in terms of use of these kind of instruments or maybe instruments that we don't even know about yet <coughs> to do that. But as of right now, we're like Louis Pasteur the day after he got his microscope. You know, he put a drop of pond water and looked in there and he said, oh, one do, look at it, there's a whole invisible world in there. I wonder what those little creatures do. You know, that's kind of where we are right now. Any other questions from anyone? What time is it? Because I have a question for the audience. I just wanted to ask you, so having heard all this, I wanted to get some feedback from the audience. In your practices or whatever capacity you work in, what, what are the diagnostic changes that you think will impact you the most or that sort of struck you the most as you listened to the presenters today? It can be the changes in the autism spectrum. Most definitely, um, with Ashburner's changing, with Rhett's being taken off, um, those definitely are going to be changing a great deal of the clients that I work with. What, who else? What else? I think classifying severity levels um, and using the system that they have now and have come up with is going to change. Yeah, just figuring out how to do it. What else? Dr. Bundy. Yes. We're curious. Um, we're school psychologists and we're curious, hey, it's Melissa. <laughs> um, we're curious how quickly the state eligibility criteria is going to fall in line with the DSM-5. Good question for Dr. Crow. What do you think? Soon? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually think, uh, in, in particular looking at the intellectual disability area, um, it's probably uh, preceded DSM-5. I mean, they changed the labels, uh, et cetera. So I, I don't think uh, it's going to drastically change that. One of the concerns I would have um, down the road, and I, I think the criteria is sort of loose now anyways, is you mentioned that the ADHD bar is being lowered. And one of the things I've seen being involved in the schools for years, uh, the increase in OHI. Uh -huh. uh, has been almost as dramatic as the increase in, in autism over, over time. Um, I, th I think a lot of times, probably with, um, uh, it'd be interested with the disruptive mood dysregulation, whether that's going to get kids services mm -hmm. under OHI or whether it's going to be an EBD qualifier. And again, with the schools, uh, it, it, it's always amused me when I've seen cases where you have a kid who's in uh, emotional and behavior disorder classes and there's no evidence of any kind of a DSM diagnosis. So we're saying this, this kid is serious enough to be placed, but, but there's no evidence of, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure a diagnosis is, is <coughs> necessary, but uh, as it stands now, it's really under, under uh, OHI where, where we really look at, at DSM currently. So I wouldn't anticipate a, a huge rush to changes a, across states. Um, and, and again, with, intel, with intellectual disabilities, uh, it's, it's interesting when you look at the different states, and I think it's becoming more consistent, 
um, states still use different terms. For example, in Ohio, they use the term cognitive disability. <laughs> and I was attending I was <coughs> some workshops up there several years ago, and the folks, it was in Ohio, it was in Columbus, and they kept talking about the kids with CD. I kept thinking communication disorder. Well, it's cognitive uh, disability. Uh, so I, I would say DSM is sort of catching up a little bit at this point. The thing that the thing that I'm most excited about with the differences in the intellectual disabilities is that they're, from what you you explained today, there's going to be more emphasis on the adaptive deficits. And we have so many kids that, based on eligibility criteria, they miss the mark by just a small amount on the cognitive scores, say for MMD. But yet, adaptively, they are not functioning in the classroom, but we can't qualify them. Yeah, I, I personally would like to see a little bit more of that uh, plus or minus. Uh, in, the, in the MMD, I think. In the MMD. Uh, yeah. Because then again, it's a pretty strict criteria, although what I've seen in, with a lot of kids, again, as they get older, they don't necessarily, and if the kid qualified with a 68 and they come back for uh, reeval in three years and the kid's got a 71, I, I see a lot of those kids being retained uh, anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, because it does come down to the ARC decision uh, uh, mm -hmm. in general, and I don't see the state going in and saying, oh, you, you've got kids with 72 IQs in here. Uh, Etc. But th there really should be an increased emphasis on the functional and adaptive assessment. But it's also you have really have to, as I said earlier, really have to look at the look at the validity of it and and that it matches. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I work with uh, <clears throat> severe and persistent mental illness. Um, so I think you know some of the changes in the um, schizophrenia spectrum is going to be interesting to deal with, but I thought it was interesting with the mood disorders, you know, well, having OCD move to its own thing is interesting, um, but um, it looks like, you know, diagnosing um, major depressive disorder now won't be comorbid with anxiety a lot, it will be major depressive disorder with anxiety features, and so I think that might be one of the kind of pragmatic things that ends up changing. Instead of having two different Instead diagnoses. Instead of having two different diagnoses, and then making that clinical judgment, which is actually causing the greater impairment, you know, uh, is it is it just with features, is it its own distinct disorder? Um, I think that's going to be one of those challenges. I think the specifiers are nice when it's this is the hint or the trend that the disorder has, but but sometimes it's, it's I don't know, it's almost too helpful, right? Yeah. It's so specific, and and I, I realize that you know, the client and I, we you know, we drive treatment, and so we decide which element of the the goal that we want to focus on. So yes, pragmatically in the session, it doesn't matter. If I write down depressive disorder, and anxiety features, or depressive disorder, and social phobia. But, you know, and if, if they do uh, want to, I mean, we have uh, clients who um, apply for disability, you know, and is having these specifiers going to make an, an important difference in applying for disability when you don't have two different disorders that you're going to have? <laughs> uh, sure. So those are kind of the concerns that I, I have. What is your name? I can speak that to a little bit of a disability. I don't work down here. I work down here. Uh, you don't get extra points by having more Yeah, well, I think part of it is, yeah, is the severity. Does the severity of the anxiety get revealed in the fact that it's a specifier rather than being a severity? No, because it, you, you have to have an impairment mm -hmm. that would in all likelihood yield uh, enough deficit where it would, for uh, Social Security, mm -hmm. that would get in the way of working. Okay. Yes. So it really, where where you run into inconsistencies where you have somebody who would say, let's say, this person has mild depression and there's alleging or claiming all these limitations. It's really once they have the, the diagnosis and if it's reasonable that it could produce the limitations, then it gets into the functional. Uh, Social Security is very heavy in, in particular with the psychiatric diagnosis mm -hmm. with 
with looking at uh, the person's ability to function. So the, the, the severity index is more important to... to, to, to it, it will probably get looked at a little bit, but, you know, the GAF, which I joked mm -hmm. about earlier, you know, I, I've seen people be evaluated by different professionals, three different professionals within a week, and you get a GAF from 30 to 70. So the, this, I think the, the severity, if, if you say somebody's severely impaired, obviously that's going to get a little bit more attention mm -hmm. than, than mild. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be factored in, but I, I, you know, I may be a little bit biased since I've been doing this so long. But I, I think the uh, people who evaluate uh, the claims do a pretty good job of balancing the diagnostic information, the functional information, mm -hmm. and sort of that it that all makes, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Do you see any differences influencing disability for kids in the diagnosing of it? Because I all have some kids who who come in and say, you know, you know, mommy said it'd be bad, so I get my check. Or they'll say, I have this, so I get my check. I need this diagnosis for my check. Or they they look at. Well, I have some kids that I've had teenage research what they need to have to get a disability check. You know, things like that. It's the it's their own. I think. The vast majority of people who apply for disability are doing it genuinely. Um, and there are, I mean, I've seen instances with evaluating kids where, uh, you know, they, they've told uh, the psychologist evaluating them, I'm here to get my crazy check, okay? Uh, but that's, that's a small percentage. And one of the things, uh, again, with, with kids, uh, as much as possible, and you probably, for those who work in the schools for teachers complain about having to fill out all the, the forms, they try to get as much collateral information as, as possible, not just a, you know, a one-shot uh, kind of thing. This is where special ed records are, are very, very useful um, in terms of uh, sort of putting, putting the whole puzzle together. Because I always document stuff when kids come and say stuff like that. I'm like, because they want that check. And because they've heard from, you know, if they get a diagnosis, they, I have something that immediately run out, won't get papers, won't even apply for disability. But I, I've seen reports where a kid has made that kind of comment, and then you look at the, the evidence and you go, well, yeah, he's, he, this, this kid's pretty impaired, so it's not, it doesn't necessarily rule out that they're uh, uh, sort of exaggerating. That. It's kind of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Yeah. Beth, any other questions for the audience? Looks like some of the audience is vacant. <laughs> These people yeah. here phones are too nice to leave, but the distance sites have gone. Thank you all for being with us today. We appreciate your completed evaluations, and let's also thank our panelists.